Oh, hi. Thanks for tuning in. Sorry. Carbo loading for a big Call of Duty tournament this weekend. Um, today we're talking about carbohydrates. Um, basically, our fancy biological word for sugars. Um, we're going to talk about what they look like, how they function, how they're made, why they're so tasty. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're talking about carbohydrates, or sugars, in most contexts. So like nucleic acids and proteins, carbohydrates are polymers. Uh, they consist of repeating monomeric subunits that we call monosaccharides. Some of them are quite familiar. We'll meet them in just a minute. But let's just remind ourselves, just like every other biological macromolecule, they are created through dehydration synthesis, also known as condensation reactions. And similarly, when we break down a large carbohydrate, we break it down through a process of hydrolysis. The former process, dehydration synthesis, is going to create large carbohydrates by removing water, and hydrolysis will simply cut them back into smaller pieces by replacing that water. And this is something that we talked about in a previous video uh, in our introduction to biological macromolecules. If you haven't seen that video, go to this link here. So carbohydrates, despite the fact that they are variations on a theme, i.e. just ran different combinations of monomeric subunits, they do come in lots of different shapes and sizes, and they do have different functions. So first, let's start by introducing ourselves to some of the common monosaccharides. So carbohydrates, because they're polymers, can actually be broken down into a very basic chemical equation. The chemical formula for almost all carbohydrates is C to the N, H to the 2N, O to the N. In other words, for every, carbo, or for every carbon and every oxygen atom you have in a carbohydrate, there are two hydrogen atoms. So for example, let's look at glucose. Glucose is by far and away the most common monosaccharide on the planet. It has the chemical formula C6H12O6. So you can see there are twice as many hydrogens as there are carbons and oxygens in that molecule. If we look at something, for example, like xylose, xylose is going to have five carbons. It's a plant sugar. Five carbons, which means it's going to have 10 hydrogens and five oxygens, C5, H10, O5. But let's look at something interesting. Let's look at another molecule that has the chemical formula C6H12O6. But instead of being glucose, I'm talking about fructose. Now, glucose and fructose, while having the exact same chemical formula, have different chemical structures. This is what we call a group of isomers. They are a pair of isomers. Isomers are molecules that have the same chemical formula, but because the bonds are different, they have a different chemical structure. And this is very important biologically because glucose and fructose serve completely different functions and they actually taste different to you because your body perceives those different chemical structures differently. For example, glucose. If anybody who's watching this video has ever been pregnant or been suspected of having diabetes, they may have undergone something called a glucose challenge where they have to drink this little bottle of orange or whatever flavored sugar water, and then about an hour later have to get a blood test to see how their body handles that glucose. One of the things is it's not particularly tasty. Glucose is not really a sweet sugar. On the other hand, Fructose is the kind of sugar that we find in plants. So when you eat apples or grapes or other fruits like that that are very sweet, that's because they produce fructose. Same chemical formula, different chemical structures, and because of that, different biological properties. Now, what happens if we combine two different monosaccharides together? We use an enzyme to perform a dehydration synthesis reaction remove a water, water molecule equivalent, and match two monosaccharides together. Well, we end up with something called a disaccharide. And depending upon which monosaccharides go into making that disaccharide, depends on which disaccharide we get out of it. So for example, if we take one glucose and enzymatically link it to another glucose molecule, we produce a sugar called maltose. And maltose has 
not a super sweet taste. If you've ever had like malted milk balls uh, or a chocolate malted milkshake, that's the taste you get out of it. It's also responsible for sort of the caramel flavor of uh, darker beers and, and, and sodas and things like that. Okay, but what happens if we take one glucose and instead of matching it with another glucose, we pair it with a fructose. One glucose plus one fructose, enzymatically linked together, gives us something called sucrose. And sucrose is table sugar. It's what we add to our coffee. It's what you find in uh, it's what you find in a lot of sodas, for example. It's that white table sugar that we get from sugar cane or from sugar beets. It gives us that nice sweet flavor that we like. On the other hand, what happens if we take glucose and instead of enzymatically linking it with another glucose or another fructose, we link it to something called a galactose. Another sugar, by the way, with the chemical formula C6H12O6, so another isomer of glucose. Instead, we end up in this case with lactose. Lactose is milk sugar. It's what gives milk its sweet flavor. It's also something that a lot of adults can't process. And this is why people that often consume dairy products as adults, they have to take something like a lactate or they have to drink lactose-free milk because in many adults, once you get past the age of two actually, most human beings start becoming insensitive to lactose because we lose the production of the enzyme lactase, which helps to break these down and cause gas and cramps and things like that. But what happens if we go beyond linking just two monosaccharides together? Well, that's where things get really interesting. If we start doing enzymatic reactions where we link more than two monosaccharides together, we end up with what are called polysaccharides. And polysaccharides can have hundreds, thousands, even hundreds of thousands of different individual carbohydrate monomers, quite frequently glucose, linked together. And polysaccharides can have lots of different functions. Most monosaccharides and disaccharides usually have dietary implications. They're broken down by the cell to produce energy. That is not the case with all polysaccharides. And as we'll see, some polysaccharides are dietary. On the other hand, some polysaccharides are structural in, how, in what they do. So let's start by discussing structural polysaccharides. First one we'll talk about is cellulose. Cellulose is a polysaccharide that consists of thousands of different glucose monomers all enzymatically linked together through chemical covalent bonds. Cellulose is produced almost exclusively by organisms in the algae and plant kingdoms. So these are plants and their very close relatives, the algae, and it's found in their cell wall. Cellulose provides rigid structural support for plants in the form of their cell wall. Now what's interesting is despite the fact that cellulose is a large molecule that just consists of thousands and thousands of glucose molecules attached to each other, and glucose is a monosaccharide that can be broken down by almost any known cell on the planet Earth, almost very few organisms on the planet can actually break down cellulose, in particular animals. Animals lack the production of the enzyme known as cellulase. So you may be thinking to yourself, okay, then how do herbivores, for example, like cows and sheep and things like that, how do they get by almost exclusively eating grasses, which have high levels of cellulose? How do they make that happen? Well, the answer is simple. In the guts of almost any one of these organisms, you are going to find microbes, bacteria, archaea, that are able to produce the enzyme cellulase. Cellulase breaks down the cellulose that's ingested by these animals, breaking it back down into the glucose monomers that those particular animals can absorb. It's what we call a symbiotic relationship. We'll talk about relationships like that later on in the course. Here's another example of a structural polysaccharide. This one comes from the cell walls of fungi, members of the kingdom fungi, and also can be found in some animals. This is called chitin. Now chitin is not a polysaccharide that consists of repeating subunits of glucose. Instead, it consists of repeating subunits of a monomer called glucosamine. Glucosamine is essentially a glucose molecule that has been modified by the addition of an amine group on one of the carbons. And if you take thousands of these glucosamine molecules and enzymatically link them together through covalent bonds, you end up with the polysaccharide chitin. Chitin provides rigid structural support for fungi in the form of their cell wall, just like we see in the cell walls of plants and algae. 
But some animals also produce chitin, in particular arthropods. If you've ever stepped on a bug and wonder why it crunches when you step on it, it's because its exoskeleton is chitin-based. And because most animals don't produce chitinase, an enzyme that would break down chitin, it means that most exoskeletons of arthropods are also indigestible. And the cell walls of fungi are also indigestible, which explains why both of those particular organisms tend to be somewhat low calorie. Just like a lot of plants, our bodies simply cannot digest those particular polysaccharides. A third example of a structural polysaccharide is something called peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan is a structural polysaccharide found specifically in organisms from the domain bacteria. Bacteria are prokaryotes, small microscopic unicellular organisms. Most of them have a cell wall, and in most cases, that cell wall is made out of peptidoglycan. Again, peptidoglycan is not a polysaccharide that consists entirely of glucose monomers. Instead, it consists of repeating subunits of N-acetylglucosamine, the same thing that makes up chitin, alternating with uh, muramic acid, okay, and alternating between these two different these two different monomers results in a long chain carbohydrate polysaccharide known as peptidoglycan but where does the peptido part come in it's simple these long strands of carbohydrates are joined together by short strands of protein so peptidoglycan is is basically a carbohydrate that consists of a large carbohydrate segment joined together or stitched together with little pieces of protein these provide rigid structural support for most species of bacteria and in fact because those cells are so reliant upon their cell wall in order for to survive and because animals like humans don't produce peptidoglycan it makes the cell wall an outstanding antibiotic target for example drugs like penicillin and ampicillin specifically target the production and synthesis of peptidoglycan. Disruption of dis peptidoglycan synthesis prevents the cell walls from being made and eventually leads to the death of those particular bacteria. There are also a number of different dietary polysaccharides or nutritional ones. So for example, organisms such as plants and algae, if they want to store carbohydrates for later use as a source of energy, they will do so by linking thousands or tens of thousands of different glucose molecules together through an enzymatic reaction to produce a polysaccharide known as starch. So you may be thinking, but if we link a bunch of glucose molecules together in plants and algae, don't we end up with cellulose? It depends on the enzyme using to make the polysaccharide. While both starch and cellulose consist entirely of glucose monomers, the bonds that create those polysaccharides are different. In fact, the linkages between the glucose molecules in cellulose and starch are pretty much upside down relative to each other. What's interesting about that is this. In both plants and animals, the enzymatic, the chemical bonds that are formed between the glucose monomers in starch can be broken down. Animals do not possess the enzyme cellulase to break down cellulose, but they do possess enzymes called amylases that can break down the covalent bonds that link the glucose molecules in starch. So while plants can store energy, store glucose in the form of cellulose or starch, only starch can be utilized in a dietary, in a dietary manner. So when we consume things like potatoes or we consume starchy foods like corn or, or wheats and things like that, what we're breaking down from them, the sugars we get out of those, are in the form of starch. Our body will then break, them, break the starch molecules down into glucose, and then we can use that glucose to produce ATP and other forms of energy. Alternatively, we can take those glucose molecules and store them for later use. Because both animals and fungi also have the ability to store energy in the form of polysaccharides. But it's not starch. Only plants and algae produce starch. We link ours together in a molecule known as glycogen. And just like starch and just like cellulose, glycogen is a polysaccharide that consists entirely of glucose monomers. In humans, glycogen is stored mainly in the liver, but also in the muscle tissues. And when our cells need a rapid supply of energy, the first thing that gets mobilized is our glycogen stores. They get activated. 
glycogen debranching enzymes in our cells can break that glycogen down into glucose. It can get secreted into the bloodstream and our cells can take up that glucose to rapidly produce ATP. In fact, that is the first source of energy that's actually tapped when our body's in need. If you watched our video on lipids, one of the things you may recall is that the other major form of energy storage that we have in our body are fat cells, things like lipocytes. We don't usually tap our stores of fat until we've exhausted our carbohydrate energy supply first. Now, what's interesting is carbohydrates have recently come under fire, particularly from the nutritional world. And there are a number of diets that are going around right now that exclude carbohydrates almost entirely or altogether. Now, the reasoning for this is because carbohydrates really are sort of a cheap energy supply. They're usually fast acting and they, they can go away very quickly. But also, eating too many carbohydrates isn't a good thing. Carbohydrates, if you remember, are basically sugar. And consuming too many carbohydrates, for sure, can contribute to things like obesity and diabetes. But there are lots of other good things that carbohydrates do that help our bodies. So for example, carbohydrates, while they may not be as long lasting, carbohydrates do supply about half the calories of fats, for example. So if a diet focuses too, many, too much on fats, well, carbohydrates give you about half the amount of calories per unit as fats do. Remember, fats are very calorically dense, if you recall from our video on lipids. But they also give us a feeling of fullness. When you eat carbohydrates, when you eat starchy meals, for example, think about eating pancakes. Pancakes, that, that, that starch that gets, the, the starch gets in your system, it absorbs a lot of moisture, it swells up, it gives you a feeling of fullness that other sources of energy like proteins and fats can't really give you, which does make you feel full longer. Also, foods that contain lots of carbohydrates like cellulose. Cellulose is also known as dietary fiber. Our body can't digest that. So when we get that dietary fiber into our bodies, it actually works its way through our digestive tract and has lots of beneficial effects. For example, you may have heard somebody refer to it as roughage. Why? Because your body can't break it down. And as that roughage, things like lettuce and leafy greens and things like that make their way through your intestines, they irritate the intestinal lining. That causes your intestinal lining to secrete mucus. That mucus is actually what helps keep you regular. That's why some people that, that have problems, uh, particularly going to the bathroom, they may take things like Metamucil. All they're taking is cellulose, usually, to help their bodies secrete more of that mucus that help them, that help them uh, go to the bathroom more regularly. The other thing that carbohydrates can do to us is it turns out that that uh, high levels of dietary fiber can help lower things like cholesterol and they can help aid in other digestive processes. So while eating too many carbohydrates may not be a good thing, in fact, eating too much of anything probably isn't a good thing after all. Eat, can, a diet containing a, a, a relatively small amount or a, a good amount of carbohydrates can actually be quite healthy for you. They are one of the four essential macromolecules that our bodies need in order to survive. So I would say when it comes to diet, the biggest thing to think about is moderation. You shouldn't be eating too many carbohydrates, nor should you be eating too many proteins or too many lipids or too many nucleic acids, although nucleic acids really aren't something that contributes to diet. Diet in moderation. So today was all about carbs. We talked about how they're made, dehydration synthesis, as with all biological macromolecules, how they're broken down, hydrolysis, again, as with all other biological macromolecules. We also learned that carbohydrates are polymers that consist of monosaccharide monomers, things like glucose and fructose. If we combine two different monosaccharides together or two of the same monosaccharides together, we get a disaccharide. And while monosaccharides and disaccharides largely have roles in terms of dietary uses, it's the polysaccharides where we see a vast difference. If we combine multiple monosaccharides together, we end up with a polysaccharide. Some polysaccharides, things like cellulose, peptidoglycan, chitin, these are structural polysaccharides found in the cell walls of various organisms. On the other hand, we have dietary polysaccharides, things like glycogen and starch that can be utilized and broken down by cells as a source of energy. Hope you learned a lot today. I hope to see you guys real soon and thanks for tuning in.